समुद्र वसने देवी पर्वत स्तन मंडिते विष्णु पत्नी नमस्तुभ्यम पाद स्पर्शम क्षमस्यमे ओ ओशन ड्रेप्ड अडोन्ड विद माउंटेन्स ग्रीन ब्यूटिफुल मदर अर्थ फिव मी फॉर स्टेपिंग ऑन यू People in the desert village of Kichen in Rajasthan are expectantly waiting for their friends. It must be cold in Mongolia and the time for the demoiselle cranes to undertake their annual expedition. The 7000 odd residents of Kichen in Rajasthan's Palori district take it upon themselves to feed over 3000 kilograms of grain each day to satiate the massive appetite of the hordes of visiting cranes. escaping the winter wrath of their home environments flying across the himalaya to visit them for the winter months the cranes often risk their lives by flying as high as 26000 feet in altitude to reach the balmy winter climes of western india in the 1970s some 100 cranes used to visit the village this number has now gone up to over 20000 cranes and the villagers consider themselves blessed to have these regal visitors come to them each year in turn the villagers have begun to host bird watchers animal lovers tourists and conservationists from around the world making kichen a major birding hotspot in asia and earning income for some of the homes in the village which have been converted into birding homestays The Jain villagers in this Thar desert village town adore the cranes as much for their apparent vegetarian eating habits as for their practice of monogamy. There is a quiet understanding and appreciation between the local people and the visiting cranes that seem to revel in the Indian belief of Atithi Devo Bhava, Sanskrit for the guest is equivalent to God. This saying is taken from an ancient Hindu scripture which became part of the code of conduct for hindu society the international crane foundation also supports the villagers work now and the village attained international recognition when it was highlighted in birding world magazine this girl heading to school with the backdrop of the cranes is a telling image of the happy balance that has been attained between the people and these visiting harbingers of happiness Rajasthan is fast becoming a crane paradise. India has an age-old cultural linkage with wildlife and habitat conservation. And while the new India has been coming to terms with population, water, land and other resource pressures, we are slowly turning back to our cultural roots. carrying along 1.2 billion indians and balancing the priorities of the natural world is a necessary and worthy challenge for south asia india has fabulous geography and color a great variety of landscapes and more diversity in its cultural arena than perhaps any other country in the world and yet we all exist in a strange sense of equilibrium with ourselves and our natural environment finding balance through culture religion humanity and our professions while our cities may not readily demonstrate this sense of balance india really is a rural country and numerous examples across the subcontinent readily illustrate the cultural mindsets that are helping bringing about the involvement of rural indian communities in the conservation process not as much through rules but by going back to our roots In fact, the entire northeastern region of India is dotted with examples of community stewardship and individual efforts to protect wildlife. Situated in the cusp of Eurasian, tropical and Indo-Malayan biogeographic realms, few countries in the world can boast of a natural heritage as diverse as India. Reverence of nature, respect of its elements and wise social customs has led to conservation of an incredible variety of plants and animals. The large number of sacred groves across the country stand testimony to the Indian philosophy of man being subordinate to nature. Communities in India have viewed themselves as part of the ecosystem, intricately linked with their fellow creature, whether tree, bird, stream or even rock. Hence, 
Conservation by communities extends beyond the limited boundaries of areas protected under statutory provisions. Rural communities have been involved in the conservation process around many of the national parks and protected areas of India. A large number of people living in the vicinity of these protected areas and sanctuaries have been made responsible for protecting and conserving forests and even obtained certain minor forest produce rights from the forests that they help protect. While tiger, elephant, rhino and other big game hunting was a popular sport in the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century, for Britishers and the kings and heads of princely states, with independence, a sense of responsibility and a need for national stewardship of our wildlife resources began to shape up. But it was not until the early 70s that India, as a responsible state, started work on conservation issues. The tiger, the most powerful predator on the planet, and India's national animal was sliding towards extinction. Poaching was still taking a toll. The Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 came into force to protect India's wildlife and specially species that were critically endangered. This added a nationwide structure and laws to the newly evolving voice for conservation. In the following year, Project Tiger was launched in 1973 and the tiger was brought under its protection. Over the years, the Ministry of Environment and Forests, with the various forest department wings, ensured that the protected reserves started attaining unique personalities and wildlife tourism gained ground. The wider middle class started visiting national parks instead of just going to hill stations and temple towns. An economy developed around this middle class tourism. Foreign travellers added to the international interest, initially in tiger tourism, but then a wider interest started developing in niche, bird, flower and animal species. The next step in the conservation paradigm was the natural need to involve local communities as they were already invested in their neighbourhood forests. A similar example comes from central India from the Kanha Tiger Reserve, home to an important tiger population in the country. This reserve was also notified among one of the first nine tiger reserves in 1973 under Government of India funded Project Tiger. The authorities work closely with the people of eight villages in the core area and 165 villages in the buffer zone. Project Tiger has been recognized as one of the most successful conservation efforts globally. From a mere 1,100 tigers left in the wild, the numbers reached 4,300 or somewhere in between at least. Tourist operators have employed trackers and guides who originally hailed from families of hunters. Having been trained, their families now gain support from high-value tourism and conservation. Villagers are employed by the tourism operations. Even the forest department has hired villagers and trackers as forest guards. The Gond tribals readily invite tourists home to see their tribal homesteads as they know that their family members work in the nearby tourist resorts. They retain their tribal identity with pride and benefit from high-value tiger tourism that brings in salary income, tips and other benefits to their communities. The Bharatpur Okyola Deo Ghana Bird Sanctuary is a human-made habitat originally created for hunting but now turned into a conservation wetland, one of Asia's finest. Here, villagers are included as conservationists by acting as guides and birding cycle rickshaw pullers. They even know the scientific names of the herons and bitterns. One more shining example of voluntary community stewardship comes from the northwestern states of Punjab and Rajasthan where the Bishnois practice a religion of 29 tenets propagated by their guru Jambaji. Two of the tenets specified ban on felling of any green tree and killing any animal or bird. The Bishnois therefore do not permit hunting. Their effort has resulted in maintaining a healthy population of black buck antelope in the Aboha region of Punjab leading to a declaration of private land of 13 villages as a wildlife sanctuary, perhaps the only wildlife sanctuary on private land. 
The difference between this reserve and other sanctuaries is that there is no fence and the black buck are allowed to browse in the fields irrespective of the crop loss which it may cause. In the Thar, where life is a fight for survival, there lives a community for whom saving the environment is their religion. The Bishnois of Rajasthan show that it is possible to live in harmony with nature. Their founder Guru Jambeshwarji, also known as Jamboji, was born in 1451 in a warrior class family of Rajasthan. The community got its name from the 29 teachings of Jamboji known as Bishnoi. Bish which is 20 and Noi which is 9 in the common dialect. Bishnois do not cut trees, instead they use dried cow dung as fuel. Each family creates a tank in their field to provide water for black buck and chinkara antelope. They also maintain groves for animals and birds to feed in. Bishnois often live in little hamlets called dhanis, with just a few round huts with intricate thatched roofs. They scrub the floors of their huts and the common courtyards, which are always kept meticulously clean, and cook in earthen ovens. The women take equal part in preserving nature by walking a long distance to get firewood from fallen trees and letting the newborn animal orphans even suckle their breast milk like their own children. They are passionate lovers of wild animals. It is because of their protection that in Bishnoi dominated areas, deer and antelope are seen grazing in the green fields. Despite the fact that the state of Rajasthan where Bishnois mainly live faces severe water shortage. As one moves further north to the high-altitude Himalay, one finds communities involved in protecting the snow leopard, an elusive but strikingly beautiful species. This mysterious cat inhabits alpine and subalpine areas at an altitude of 3,000 to 4,500 meters above sea level. Resource crunch on the snow-clad mountains leads the leopard to hunt villagers' livestock, resulting in man-animal conflict. Project Snow Leopard was initiated by the Government of India along with Snow Leopard Conservancy and Snow Leopard Trust with focus on joint management of the area with the local communities. Man-animal conflict was minimized by developing and distributing predator-proof improved livestock corals and a livestock insurance program was initiated. Since then, local livelihoods have been improved by initiating Himalayan homestay programs and setting up eco-cafes for tourists in 43 villages across Ladakh. This has led to an attitudinal change and helped in reducing pressure in this fragile ecosystem. In the high-altitude Ladakh region of the state of Jammu Kashmir up north, villagers and communities living around national parks and monasteries such as Hamis, in valleys such as Nubra and marshlands such as Hanle, have taken to snow leopard conservation in consonance with the forest department and even the involvement of the Indian Army. This rare big cat that lives in these high altitudes has risen in number thanks to the effort of local villagers and the influx of high-value off-peak tourism revenues in the difficult winter months thanks to better stewardship of the habitat and an increased ungulate prey base. The village of Konoma in Nagaland is known for its community-based conservation program and for its success with the conservation of tragopan pheasants they once killed for their meat. Now, they gain economically from the homestays that have been set up in the model tribal village and the international tourists who come to visit the habitat of these beautiful Himalayan pheasants. The introduction of plastic hornbill casks in nearby Nagaland and Arunachal Pradesh has greatly stopped the demand and use of original hornbill casks and beaks as adornment by the tribal communities. At the Hornbill Festival in Kohima, all the tribal communities of Nagaland get together to celebrate their cultural diversity and richness under the sobriquet of the rare and beautiful Pied Hornbill, which so richly figures in their heritage. The rare Lesser Florican similarly seeks protection from the villagers in Rajasthan, in their monsoon fields of pulses finding the necessary protection to put on their brilliant courtship display and to follow it up with breeding.
Madras Crocodile Bank, successful private initiative to breed crocodilians. The Croc Bank of Chennai has successfully bred thousands of crocodilians for captive purposes and wild release alike in a unique private-public partnership that has trained local Irula tribals and others from across Tamil Nadu to get involved in conservation and captive breeding projects. Zero in Arunachal plants its own bamboo groves for construction of homes to save wild forests. The villagers cultivate these bamboo groves so they do not need to harvest from the wild. In the month of September in Zero, the sun is already high up in the sky by half past seven in the morning. In the traditional village homestay at Tajang village, it is time for a traditional apatani breakfast. If a beautiful day at the splendid Zero Valley begins with a hearty traditional meal, how much better is that than staying at a hotel and being just tourists? While in Zero, homestays like this ensure that a traveller gets a full experience of the place, its scenic landscapes and the culture of its people, the Apatanis. Nunu Zero is a handful of socially active and environmentally responsible Apatani men who formed the community-based NGO in Zero Valley. They have been working towards sustainable development in the area since some time now. It is Nunu Zero who have been setting up these non-profit making homestays devoid of any advertising. The harvesting season is at its peak and the villagers are out in the fields. It is mostly women that one sees harvesting the crop in the rice fields of Zero Valley. Apatanis as a tribe are closely associated with bamboo and rice cultivation. Tajang village has a bamboo grove like every other village in the valley. The bamboo grove of Tajang village is right next to the homestay. The NGO and its members aim for a balanced, sustainable and self-sufficient society which can exist in ultimate harmony with nature around. Their inspiration is the ancient traditions and folklore of the Apatanis, which have always been based on these ideals. Though primarily a rice cultivating tribe, Apatanis have always had fruit orchards in their backyards and cattle and poultry in their homes. Nunu Zero has adopted a model of tourism which is purely a learning experience, much more enriching than the regular touristy visits. It has evolved as a means of promoting the culture and the very way of life of the Apatanis. Nunu Zero's concept of responsible tourism has been globally recognized. The basics lie in the fact that everyone involved, from tourists to tour operators to the local residents, take responsibility for their actions. This works perfectly for the good of the environment and makes sustainability realizable. Conservation of the eastern hulag gibbon by the villagers in Arunachal. The villagers of Delo village have been closely involved with the conservation of the beautiful and rare hulag gibbons found at the outskirts of their village in forested areas. The calls echo out loud as the gibbons use their long arms to swing from the branches of one tree to another. But the villagers ensure their protection and no one hunts them any longer. Known for its small size, the pygmy hog is the smallest species of wild pig in the world. Scientifically known as Porcula salvania and Nol gahori or Takuri bora in Assamese, it is found only in the grasslands of the Manas Tiger Reserve of Assam in India. With the extinction of tall wet grasslands in the region, the pygmy hog is currently restricted to a single viable population in the wild in Manas Tiger Reserve and a couple of reintroduced populations in Sonai Rupai Wildlife Sanctuary and Orang National Park, all in northwestern Assam. The pygmy hog is also mentioned in the red list category of the IUCN and is categorized as critically endangered, putting it among the most threatened of all mammals. Although accurate numbers are not known, it is estimated that there may be only a few hundred, probably less than 300 pygmy hogs left in the world. It is impossible to see pygmy hogs in their wild natural habitat as they are very shy animals. They are well adapted to move fast through tall, dense grasses with their streamlined bodies. 
Pygmy hogs are very sensitive animals and their survival is closely linked to the existence of tall, wet grasslands of the region, which besides being a highly threatened habitat itself, is also crucial for the survival of a number of other endangered species. With the aim to saving the species and its habitat, the Pygmy Hog Conservation Program or PHCP, a broad-based research and conservation program is a collaborative project that has been trying to conserve pygmy hogs and other such endangered species of the tall grasslands of the region through field research, captive breeding and reintroduction after adequate restoration of degraded former habitats. One of the main activities of PHCP is conservation breeding of pygmy hogs. PHCP maintains a captive population of about 50 hogs and has reintroduced 60 hogs over five years in Sonai Rupai Wildlife Sanctuary and Orang National Park. Before release in the wild, these hogs are taught to survive independently at a pre-release facility in Potasali, Nameri Tiger Reserve, which allows them to live in a semi-wild condition away from human interference. By introducing captive bred stock in the wild, the locals who have been trained by the facility are doing valuable work in augmenting the wild population while supporting themselves and their communities through this conservation initiative. Efficient management of natural resources and protection of species requires that governance be decentralized to the lowest possible level. Some of the challenges that communities face today are unplanned development competing for land use, eroding traditional values and disintegrating knowledge systems. Support to communities can go a long way in making conservation efforts sustainable and opening up possibilities for making wildlife management efficient and responsive to ecology and livelihoods. The stories run thick and fast. India is waking up to the need to conserve its natural resources. Social media is fueling the appreciation of good work being done. Rural India is the real star of this new paradigm of people's involvement in wildlife conservation. Evolution is a cardinal principle in ecology, but as we adopt a landscape approach and value ecosystem services, the lines of William Blake become all the more relevant. To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour.